Hello, you gorgeous teacher. If you're one of my lovely regular listeners, welcome back. If you're brand new, maybe you've seen Hugh Della's name on the episode description. Welcome. I hope you stick around. If you're not too familiar with the lexical approach, may I suggest you go back and listen to episode 61, where myself and Hugh go a little bit deeper into it as to what it's actually about. This episode is more about implementing those kinds of concepts into your classes. So check out episode 60. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, seriously, do I need to say it again? One little click for you might be something small, but for me, it means the whole world. And also, guys, if you do enjoy the episode, talk me up, tell your staff room about me, tell your colleagues about me, spread the word. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. So I'm assuming you saw the episode advert on there. But if you're not following me on any of those platforms, go ahead. I post video content. I did an Instagram live last week for the first time in ages and I actually really, really enjoyed it. So if there's something that you would actually like me to talk about, just uh, send me a DM and let me know. Also, and I've said this before, I am going to launch a course in the future and it's focused around what I'm absolutely passionate about and that's building students' confidence and community in the classroom. Now, attached to the show notes is a link to a survey and it's kind of market research for me. Now, I have a good idea of what I want to do in the course, but of course, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to do the same thing. So if you just have a couple of minutes and you feel like repaying me for all this fabulous free content, just click on that link and fill in that survey for me. I'd be so, so grateful. There's also a link in the show notes to my newsletter. Now, I only send it a couple of times a month. I might send you an extra one if I'm doing an Instagram live just to alert you about it. I just let you know what I'm doing, uh, give you some tips and, you know, put all the appropriate links in there. So sign up if you feel like it. I'd be most grateful. I think that's it. So anyway, I'm sure you want me to shut up so you can listen to the fabulous Hugh Della chat about the lexical approach. It's more of a game of sort of um, activity ping pong, really. We chat about how to actually implement those ideas and theories and concepts of the lexical approach in a practical way in the classroom that doesn't really require much prep or thinking. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. Thank you for sticking around for this really long introduction. And let's crack on. <laughs> Welcome to Everything EFL Podcast. My name's Erin O'Byrne, and I absolutely love sharing my knowledge with you, my darling teacher, and helping you build not only community, but your students' confidence. I truly believe that a positive frame of mind is essential for your students to learn. There's also a bunch of other teachy stuff thrown in for good measure too. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, so my guest today is teacher, lecturer, course book writer, proponent of the lexical approach, and much more besides. Hugh Della, welcome back. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's lovely to see you again. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, you know, all things considered, yes. given the, the world that we live in at the moment. But yeah, I'm okay. I think it's a little bit more social than it was when we last spoke. This is true. So, guys, if you're listening um, and you want to know more about the lexical approach, I suggest you listen to episode 60 and also 61 and 62. Um, In episode 60, Hugh goes very deep into the lexical approach and really breaks it down. Today, we're going to approach it from a more practical side. So if you, you know, you're thinking about trying to implement more lexical things into your classroom, but you're just not sure how, we are going to share some suggestions on how you can do that in your class. So, um, yeah, we're just going to sort of take it in turns suggesting some different things. So uh, do you want to go first, Hugh? Yeah. So I think if I was going to suggest to people to change one thing, I guess, in what they're doing, it would be to think a lot more about the way in which you record new language for students. OK, and I think for a long time myself, when I was a younger teacher, kind of partly because of the way I was trained and partly because of the way in which course books framed new vocabulary for me as a teacher, I tended to write up mostly single words on the board. Um, Or perhaps I would write up something like to keep fit, to get fired, you know, cupboard, noun, this kind of thing. 
And I think the problem for students with that is kind of, well, there are multiple problems um, with that way of doing things for students. One is either they remember what those words mean or they don't. There's nothing there that helps them with the, the meaning. So, you know, when the students go home from class and they open up their books and they see to get fired and they look at it and kind of go, yeah, the teacher was saying something about this in class today, but I've no idea what it was. There's nothing there that helps you. On top of that, I think there's nothing there that shows students how they might use that word or how they might hear or see that word being used. And because the examples that are given are so stripped down and so minimal, there's nothing there that really recycles grammar or vocabulary that's previously been studied. So my, my first kind of suggestion would be that maybe one way to move forward is when you're looking at language that you think you might need to explain or when you're dealing with vocabulary that comes up in class, try to move beyond single words on the board or on your Word document or whatever you're using to record new language. And just think first about kind of common examples or typical things you might say. And generally, that means thinking at at least sentence level. OK, so say you, you're taking out a keep fit. You, you might just write something up on the board like I try to keep fit by going to the gym twice a week. OK, um, and if you're doing a, you know, get fired, you might write something like rather than I got fired, which people tend not to admit to, you know, that would be. I decided to move on and face a new challenge. Oh, yes. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it might be something like he got fired from his last job for being late all the time. Mm. OK. And I think what that does is it's kind of meets both those problems head on, because if you can't remember, get fired, you go home and you see he got fired from his last job. And you're like, OK, you get fired from a job. Yeah. For being late all the time. Ah, if you're late all the time, get fired. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the meaning. So the extra language consolidates the meaning, but it also allows more recycling of grammar and vocabulary. So you've got your, your past simple passive there, you know, got fired. You've got your preposition plus ing for being late all the time. You've got your recycling of all the time as a kind of time adverbial. So there's a lot more going on there that helps students get a kind of better grasp of how the language works than there would be if you were just writing to get fired. So that would be my, my first kind of advice. You know, sometimes it's literally just taking a picture of your board work at the end of a lesson mm. and going away and thinking, yeah, that wasn't great. Um, how could I have done that better? What examples could I have given you know, what were my examples like? Can I think of better ones for next time I teach that vocabulary? And focusing on that kind of thing would, would be my first tip. Yeah. And you can do that as a kind of bolt on to, to everything you're doing, because every teacher in every lesson is, is doing something with new vocabulary, you know? Yeah. So many things to say. Um, going back to the, when you said the way you were trained, I mean, yeah. Um, you were trained a while ago. I was trained a while ago. <laughs> I'm not sure. What, what are you saying? What are you saying? I'm not saying anything, you. Um, yeah, <laughs> you put me off my train of thought now. So, <laughs> Sorry. But I think we can agree that I don't think the lexical approach is still kind of incorporated into basic teacher training. Um, and yeah, the, the, the sentence level thing, I mean, you're introducing context. And again, I don't, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I don't really recall the word context being used that much in my teacher training either. No, no. Why not? Um, yeah. I mean, and then if, like you say, you know, you can take a picture of your board work and, and reflect, which is a very powerful tool for, for, for learning about your examples, you can always do better next time. If that wasn't the best example, let's choose another one, you know, brilliant. Yeah. Um, and can I also just say that you completely stole my idea there? So I'm just going to cross <laughs> that one off my list. You shouldn't have asked me to go first. <laughs> I shouldn't, um. should I? Um, OK, <coughs> um, my suggestion would be incorporate it lexically, incorporate it into your grammar, sorry, um, by focusing on common institutional phrases. So I suppose the present perfect is a great example. Focus on things like have you blank yet? Um, this is the most blank thing blank I've ever blanked um you know incorporate those those common fixed phrases um 
check out episode 72 guys i talk with joga conger about this and we ping pong loads of lexical phrases with the present perfect um it just makes more sense again using context as well rather than going we're going to do the present perfect today and we're going to yeah. contrast it with the past simple <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i know i know and in a way it's more fun because you've kind of got both things happening at once so you've got if you don't have many ideas you'll just fall back on things that you know are often said so you'll fall back on this is the best film i've ever seen um this is the worst weather i've ever experienced this is the most interesting book i've ever read Mm. um but what you'll also get is people kind of messing around and students who are a bit more comfortable and confident with it will do things like you know this is the 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 biggest hamburger I've ever seen and those kind of things you know um so it it allows space for both the predictable and the slightly more creative I think which is a good thing yeah it's lovely to for your students to have that space to get creative and you I always do a lot of dialogue building around this and I've got it from your book where you know you you have a phrase or a, a dialogue like a mini dialogue and then students add yeah. add what, to it what's said next yeah um and they speculate about who's talking and and things like that and they're creating their own context so they're contextualizing the language yeah. um usually with situations that are familiar to them so it's a win win really yeah yeah so I guess, go on, have you got one more you want to do now? Or no, do I was just about to say it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess my next idea would be kind of building on what we talked about earlier, really, um, which is once you've got better examples, you can also involve the class a bit more and create a bit more space for students to add their own ideas to what you're doing. So on one level, it's... It's kind of, it's, it's questions that you, again, I didn't get trained to ask these kind of questions on my initial training course. I, I got trained to ask kind of closed CCQs, mm. okay? So if you had something like get fired, the, the kind of questions I was encouraged to ask were, if you get fired, do you lose your job? And the students would kind of go, yes. yes. <laughs> and then you'd say, did you want to lose your job? No. no. Right, so you got fired. And there's no real involvement or engagement on students' parts there. So what I've come to do much more is just to ask, I I don't really have a a clever title for these kind of questions yet, but they're basically questions about the language you're looking at that generate connected language. And they're not personal questions per se. So it might just be things like, okay, I try to keep fit by going to the gym two or three times a week. Any other ways you might try to keep fit. Okay. Um, or he got sacked from his got fired from his last job for being late all the time. Any other reasons why people might get fired? And when you ask that, you allow space for students to bring their own life experience, their own thoughts, their own creativity, their own humor, you know, a little bit of banter, or all kinds of things to the classroom that aren't there if you're just writing to get sacked up on the board, yeah. to get fired up on the board. And it also allows you the chance to kind of work from where students are at and sometimes to learn things. So, you know, sometimes when you ask things like any other ways you keep fit, one student will go like, I don't know, zorbing. Uh, and you go, what the hell is zorbing? Oh, I've done that. They, Have you? You see, I had no idea until a Brazilian <laughs> student told me what it was. And she showed me this mad video of her rolling down a hill in this giant plastic ball. And it was like, why what 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 even is this like (laughs) when did this start happening and um she keeps fit by going zorbing on a regular basis yeah and so you know everyone everyone learns like that and and it also again it allows more recycling of grammar and vocabulary yeah those would be um in terms of ccqs i think those questions are called discrimination questions and experience questions um So, yeah, you're, you're sort of personalising, contextualising and forming connections in the brain with the, with the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and, and I guess also much, maybe even more importantly, you're often connecting it to your own experiences or your own realities. So, yeah. you know, when you ask uh, any other reasons why maybe people pass out, 
and someone tells you a story of getting tickets to see Justin Bieber and getting caught in the crush at the front of the crowd and passing <laughs> out and being carried to the medical room and then missing the concert. Um, I wasn't actually asking, has anyone in the class ever passed out? Uh, I was just asking any other reasons why you might. And what the students then have space to do is to go, oh, that reminds me of something that happened to me in Busan back in South Korea. Um, And it makes the language a bit more real and a bit more meaningful for the students, I think. And maybe a little bit stickier as a result, you know, like the language is more likely to stick in the head because it's connected to something that's come up in the class. Yeah. Something personal. Forming connections is essential. You have to form those connections. Okay. Uh, my next tip would be if you are doing a, a reading text or a listening and you can use the transcript, just take every opportunity to highlight chunks and collocations. So students actually start seeing the language as chunks of language and not individual words, because there's that temptation for them to listen or read and just look at every single individual word. And then they say, you know, what er- you know, what does bothered mean? And I'm like, well, what, what are the words around it? Can't be bothered. OK, there's a phrase it's a chunk um and I think you know students just need that little light that little light bulb moment where they 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 can break down a sentence into chunks (coughs) rather than individual words raising awareness yeah I think that's really important and I guess that also kind of places an onus on the teacher to be alert to what students are doing because again you know maybe it's a reflection of when I was trained but when I was trained back in 1842 um it it was very much about are there any words in the text you don't know or underline words in the text that you don't know and for a long time that's kind of what I used to encourage students to do and what they would do is underline bothered Uh, and I would kind of go it means worried and I'd give like a sort of basic synonym something like that And it took me a while to kind of realise that actually I had a responsibility to sort of go around, check what they were underlining, sometimes point out to them, you know, it's not bothered here. It's I can't be bothered to cook tonight. Yeah. It's, you know, look at the whole chunk. okay? Um, And so, yeah, it it does place a kind of responsibility on the teacher to be aware of what the students might be missing when they're underlining certain bits Or that they might just underline things like make the most. And you have to kind of go, yeah, it's not actually make the most. It's make the most of my time while I'm here. Or make the most of my time slash while I'm here, Mm. you know. So, yeah, it's it's good for both teachers and students to get into that kind of mindset, I think. Okay, your turn. So I guess my next thing would be just integrating a bit more conscious revision into classes okay oh you took another one (laughs) hey um, great minds Hugh great minds or or fools never different one of the two (laughs) I'll go with the first one you can never quite be sure (laughs) um (laughs) um, yeah so I, I think just making sure that you also as a teacher take some responsibility for intervening in the process of forgetting because you know in an ideal world students go home they make their own quizlet cards they revise they (laughs) extend you know all of that stuff but it often doesn't happen and you know I, I know myself as a language student that sometimes the only time you actually find to study is the hour or two hours or whatever it is per week that you set aside for the class yeah and despite your best intentions you don't get much done outside of class so Building in some kind of regular revision activities at the start of your class is really, really important. And it doesn't have to be fancy or high tech or time consuming or or dramatic. Um, If what you're doing is writing longer, better examples up on the board, you just recycle those examples and you take your sentences like um, I try to keep fit by going to the gym two or three times a week and you just gap out keep OK, um, or you, you, you take he got fired from his last job for being late all the time and you gap out from or all or, or both. And all you're really doing with those kind of exercises is just encouraging students not just to see things and understand the meaning, but to pay a bit more attention to the actual language that mm. the meanings come wrapped up in. And you're making the learning a bit more visible as well. So when students kind of go 
I got nine out of 10. You know, as a teacher, you can sort of go, well, that's good because it means you're learning something that that's nine things you didn't know two weeks ago. That's what you're paying me for. That's why we're yeah. here. <laughs> you know, so it, it kind of, it, it, it I don't know, it, it increases students' sense of progress themselves, I think, being able to do that. Yeah, and also like, um, well, first of all, review is absolutely essential. Like you cannot get around that. That's just what that is. Um, and I think as teachers, and I think we talked about this last time, you know, there's this temptation to want to sort of review everything, but yeah. obviously we don't have time for that. So yeah. what I tend to you do is prioritize. Just, yeah, focus on those really common phrases or those common mistakes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah, exploit your material, use the same sentences that they're, they're familiar. I've been doing the same kind of thing this week. And um, we've had dialogues that students built around the dreaded third conditional like um if i'd known i would have invited you so we put them all on a google doc we put all of their dialogues on the on a google doc and then um they went home and looked at it and then the next day i blanked out all of the words in the phrase except for the first letter of every word and they had to lovely uh, and then today yeah and then today i blanked out all the words with no help at all and the context just helped them immediately recall those sentences yeah brilliant even if i do say so myself (laughs) (laughs) You know, if you can't big yourself up, what, what can well, you do in life? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, I just want to say as well, guys, if you're interested in reviewing, reusing and recycling, check out episode 67. Uh, is it my turn or your turn? I think it is. My turn? Not nick one my of turn? my ideas. <laughs> well, we'll not see. I'm not sure I've got any more. <laughs> um, kind of connected to what you said, actually, about um, blanking out things. Um, again, going back to like transcripts and, and texts, exploit the material you have. So use those those transcripts and readings blank out I would say blank out phrases instead of words so what I would do is you know I would um, blank out in that sentence I keep fit by going to the gym I would blank out keep fit or Mm. by going to the gym like Mm. you know blank out chunks of language yeah lovely yeah yeah. also lovely okay you know obviously slightly more demanding but lovely yeah but you know you can get around that with a word pool or a chunk pool you know and yeah. they, they can have the choice like if you want to use it use it if you want to challenge cover it and don't use it you know mm. so i think you can get around mm. it that way okay so i guess my next idea would be to do with just learning to work more from student output and learning to give students space to talk in the class where they're talking in a more meaningful, personal, slightly extended kind of way. And they're not just talking in order to practice particular kinds of grammatical structures. Mm -hmm. And I think what you then learn is if you're kind of listening to students as they're telling you something meaningful and you're going, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. You mean blah, 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 blah. And you're working from what they're saying. I mean, in a way, you break out of a lot of the way in which you're, you're, you've maybe been trained to teach because when you're being trained to teach, you, you're kind of always encouraged to believe that grammar structures and vocabulary have particular levels, okay? Yeah. And that students can't meet these things until they get to those levels. When you're actually just talking to someone and they're trying to communicate a meaning to you, the grammar and the vocabulary that they need to express those meanings are at their level because that's what they're trying to say. Mm. And it's often just things like, you know, I don't know. um, Sorry, I I, I leave early today. Um, I I make appointment my girlfriend. If late, you know, they'll do something like this. Uh, And you let's, you know, say that's an elementary or a pre-int student. And what you're then doing is to say, okay, no problem. That's fine. You can leave at half past 11. Let's just look at how to say that better. So, Mm -hmm. sorry, I have to leave early today. Um, Not I have an appointment because your girlfriend's not a doctor, I don't think. Is she? No, she's not. So I'm meeting my girlfriend at 12. If I'm late, yeah, that's right. She'll kill me. Okay. Uh, And you're just kind of giving them that. And maybe you haven't done the present continuous for future arrangement yet maybe you have it doesn't really matter maybe you haven't done first conditionals yet maybe you have it doesn't really matter because what you're doing there isn't presenting the present continuous for future usage or presenting first conditionals you're just showing them how to say what they tried to say better yeah and so I think as a teacher 
it's recognizing that you can do a lot of that kind of thing and that those sentences will be understood by students if what you're doing is working from what they've tried to say already. Mm. And I think what that does is it kind of breaks you out of that rigid, regimented way of thinking about what students can and can't or or should or shouldn't see or say or, or be exposed to at particular levels. So I think just, you know, more space for students to express real meanings and to use the language to say things that are meaningful for them and more working from that and reformulating and rewording things for them. And it gives you like a plethora of material to reuse, review and recycle. It's language they need. Um, Yeah. um, Yeah. I mean, I also think like giving students space just to talk um, can only increase their confidence. And then if, if you're reformulating, I mean, I generally tend to avoid the word correct mistakes. I generally tend to say, let's make some changes. And I think that um, enables, again, enables students confidence and then gets them to go, okay, so if I speak, my my teacher's going to help me instead of correcting me. And I think that shift in mindset can really help students. It's a very, you know, it's one of the things I've often thought about teaching is that little changes can make big differences. Yeah, massively. it's one of those things where it's literally just changing one sentence in your teaching. Okay. R- rather than kind of going, that was great, but you made 22 mistakes. Well, what you're doing is to kind of say, that was great. Let's look at how to say that better. Yeah. Or that was great. Let, let's look at how we can change that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and they're very different messages to the students because they're much more validating and accepting of what the students have already managed whilst also offering the the kind of promise of, you know, improvement beyond what they've already managed to communicate. Mm. Um, and I, I think it, it just kind of reduces that that grammar anxiety that so many students suffer from. Yeah. Um, words have power. They really do. Yeah. Um, OK, I've got another one. It's probably my last one. Um, okay. It's kind of again, it's it's kind of awareness raising more than anything. But um, what's What's good to do, especially with lower levels, I think, is I'm, I'm a big fan of writing things on cards and cutting them up and, you know, kinesthetic activities. Um, sentence construction. If you break a sentence into chunks, even if they're fairly simple and it's kind of simple for students to reorder them, it just raises their awareness. So, for example, um, if you have something like if you're doing adverbs of frequency, you could have something like I always go to the gym. So go to the gym would be on one card. There's no reason mm-hmm. to cut those words up. Keep them on one card so you can see it as a chunk or something like I go to the gym all the time. So, again, mm-hmm. all the time would be on one card. There's no reason to break those up because it's a mm-hmm. chunk. Um, so I just yeah, I just think that raising again, just raising the awareness of those chunks of language and, and you know, they, they can kind of see it and they're maneuvering and manipulating those chunks. I just think personally Mm. I think it's a good idea what do you think I think that's lovely (laughs) um I think kind of connected to that and something that you can expand beyond that depending on level and your students is a kind of principled way of using L1 and I think for a lot of teachers out there they'll be kind of bilingual a lot of the time and they'll be working with students who share a mother tongue with them And in those kind of contexts, I think those teachers have a a sort of superpower, which is the ability to shift between the two languages which already exist in that classroom if you're working with monolingual students. And one thing that I think is really, really, really useful to do and to start doing it early on is to do this two-way translation process where you get students to look at sentences, they translate them back into their own first language, and then later, maybe together, maybe collaboratively as a whole collaboratively as a whole class you translate them back into English and you notice if there's any gaps or problems and I think what a lot of students can do is they can see an English sentence like I don't know I haven't seen you for ages they can translate that into their own first language Um, then when they come to try to say it in English what they'll do is they'll look at their own first language version and they'll translate it badly word for word And a lot of students kind of get by like that, you know, so they understand the English when they see it or hear it. They can process it back into French, say. But then when they speak English, they say something like, oh, Erin, it is a long time since I didn't see you. 
and you kind of go, yes, I know. And you kind of understand they mean I haven't seen you for ages. But what they're doing is hearing I haven't seen you for ages, understanding it, translating it back, translating it back into English in a word for word, weird French way and sort of getting by because it's sort of intelligible. So I think that kind of process helps you notice the different ways in which ideas are expressed and grammaticalized and lexicalized between languages. And it also helps you kind of catch these little glitchy patterns which fall outside of what we traditionally think of as grammar. So if you just translate something really simple, like my parents want me to study business, okay? Like, you know, an elementary or a pre-intermediate sentence, say. Lots of languages, when you translate that into the first language and then back, will say, my parents want that I study, Mm. okay? Because that's the kind of pattern that goes with want. And that's not grammar in the way that course books often present grammar. It's not grammar in the way in which Raymond Murphy deals with grammar in his English grammar in use. It's kind of the micro grammar of the individual word want. Like in English, you want someone to do something. In other languages, you want that somebody does something. And there's no reason why it's that way in English or why it's, it's just is. That's just how it is. And so I think that two way got that process of two-way translation into and then later out of and then in back later back into English really catches those kind of weird little glitches you know mm, yeah I like it a big fan of that good stuff um yeah and I'm sure there are a few um bilingual teachers listening so uh yeah, so. give it a go okay um we'll leave it there um I really appreciate your time Hugh um You're welcome it's been really lovely talking to you again Thank you. And, and I, thanks for your interest in what we do. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, I'm, I'm trying, you know, as much as I can to incorporate the lexical approach into my teaching and also into like my videos and, and my podcasts and stuff, because it just makes sense. You know, I, I like to think so. I yes. like to think so. So, you know, keep keep plugging on like uh, it's brilliant um, seeing you do what you do as well. Like um, so, yeah, um, have a lovely day. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, Erin. And, and um, enjoy the rest of your birthday. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, you take care.